welcome everyone to our seminar today on legal issues for landlords and property managers. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I mentioned to a few people already, but uh, you know, Daniel is a specialist in this field and uh, highly in demand. And I am so thankful that he was able to set aside this time for us to be able to speak because he is super, super busy. And I'm, um, you know, I'm happy that he was. No problem. It's my pleasure to uh, be here. And uh, it's a privilege to educate people. So why don't we get started? Um, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing law for about 30 years now. And I find uh, I focus primarily on representing property owners, property investors, housing providers, brokerages, in handling landlord tenant uh, affairs and never in my 30 years of experience have we uh, been in such a difficult time having trended out of the covid pandemic but still having some of the residue of the pandemic and what i'm going to focus on are the general rules that we're faced with how to properly handle a landlord tenant dispute and then some uh, thoughts about what we should do with particular situations especially in light of the fact that we are now uh, trending out of the pandemic but the courts are uh, still trying to get their footing and so there's a lot of delay and inertia in handling landlord tenant disputes in the courts so the, the first thing I want to go over is this. For uh, those folks who are operating primarily in uh, San Mateo County, uh, Santa Clara County, you're, properly, you're probably faced with being responsible for a core understanding of the statewide protections uh, that are summarized in AB 1482, which is in December of 2020, uh, state rent control and state just cause eviction came into effect, and it came into effect all over California. But just as this law was coming into effect, the pandemic emerged. So people were focused on issues of the pandemic and may have forgotten that, look, if you are overseeing a multi-unit property, if you are overseeing um, or owning a triplex, a duplex, a 10 unit building, you're gonna be subject to a state just cause eviction rules and rent regulations. So let's do a quick review of this for now. If you turn the slide. So the general summary of the state just cause eviction rules is that we have rent regulation for multi-unit properties. Um, there are some exceptions and um, also, landlords must have a just cause to evict. And just this morning, I had someone serve a termination notice on a multi-unit property in Walnut Creek, and they didn't realize that you can't just serve a termination notice on a tenant in a five-unit property because they're month-to-month -month tenants. And that's where a lot of the disconnect arises because people have forgotten we have state rent control and state just cause eviction rules. And maybe if your tenant doesn't know about it, the tenant attorney that will represent them in the eviction action will know about it and you will lose your lawsuit. So the general rules are we've got a cap on rent increases. You must have a just cause to evict if the tenant has been in the unit for 12 months or more. Single family homes and condominiums are exempt unless there's ownership by a corporation, a real estate trust or an LLC where one member is a corporation. New construction is exempt if it's been built within 15 years. It only applies to tenants who are in occupancy for 12 months, which means if you've got a multi-unit property and you want to give a tenant a tryout period, you may want to sign a 10-month lease because the protections of state rent control and state just cause eviction rules don't arise until the 12-month period. And then there are relocation payment obligations for no fault evictions. They're pretty minor compared to local jurisdictions. So if you represent a new buyer and they bought a triplex in an area such as South San Francisco, and they want to do a move in and terminate the tenancy because they want to move into the top unit under the new state law, you must give the tenant if they've lived there over 12 months, a termination notice, you must cite the state just cause, 
and you must give them the equivalent of one month's rent as part of the relocation payment for the no fault eviction of moving into a unit. Most importantly for you folks is you've got to know whether your building is subject to state just cause eviction rule, state rent regulation, or if it's subject to a more stringent local ordinance. So in Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, we have more stringent ordinances and uh, San Jose, we have a more stringent ordinance. So we have to know where our property is located and whether it's subject to it. And then the big exemption is that you have to remember single family homes and condominium units are typically gonna be exempt. I will tell you though, if you have an existing tenant in a single family home or a condominium unit, and you did not give them the notification that their unit is exempt, you've got to send out that notice of exemption ASAP. If you don't have that notice, email me and I'm happy to help you out. So that's a quick review of state just cause eviction rules. Let's move on. Thanks, Daniel. And there was a question as to whether, um, is that for both just cause eviction and the rent cap for the um, exception of single family homes and condos? Correct. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Now, the general just cause evictions under the state law, value to pay rent, breach of lease, nuisance, waste, which is like if you set fire to the place uh, or you allowed by your negligence a fire um, and um, the lease terminated and the tenant has refused to execute a written extension, criminal activity, assignment or subletting in violation of the lease, refusing the owner access, using the premises for an unlawful purpose, termination of a resident manager, and after given a tenant giving notice that they're terminating and they don't vacate, you can terminate. So those are the at-fault causes. The big ones that we're typically going to see is failure to pay rent or a breach of a lease agreement or nuisance. And that would, in my practice, probably be about 60 to 70% of the work I do. No fault under the state ordinance means it's no fault of the tenant that they're being asked to leave. And that's an owner move-in or a relative move-in where you buy a property and you want to move into the uh, top floor of a fiveplex unit. Uh, withdrawal of the rental unit from the rental market where you're going out of the rental business. Intent to demolish or substantially remodel the unit. And I want to focus on this substantial remodel. So let's say you see a 10 unit building for sale in Walnut Creek. The building is tired because it's a 1950s building. Even though you're subject to state just cause eviction rule, you could conceivably, if all the tenants have lived there for over a year, you could conceivably terminate all of the tenancies after you've got permits to do a renovation of the property, new roof, new flooring, updating the electrical, and you could terminate the tenancy, provide all of the tenants the equivalent of one month's rent credit, terminate, vacate, renovate, and then upgrade the units and sell an upgraded vacant building or re-rent at market rate. You don't have to offer the unit back to the tenants you displaced. So the beauty of the rent ordinance as it is, or the just cause eviction ordinance right now as it is statewide, is that you still have some benefit to looking at property, upgrading the property, terminating tenancies, and the cost to do this is not that great. It's the equivalent of one month's rent. Then the final one is the owner is complying with the court order. So if a building's been red tagged after a massive fire, you can certainly terminate the tenancy because it's no fault of the tenant but you still need to terminate to remedy the conditions existing at the property. Or if there's a rodent infestation that's so egregious that the city comes in and red tags the building, you can terminate the tenancy. So those are the no fault ones and they all require the equivalent of one month's rent credit back to the tenant. Rent increases. So let's talk about rent increases. We turn the slide. As we know, we because of the pandemic, there's been a decrease in uh, rents. Uh, there's been uh, more vacancies. 
And while um, there are increased costs, such as increased utility bills, increased uh, other related aspects of managing or owning property, rents have not caught up. I want to mention that a single family home in a condominium unit that's exempt from state rent control and state just cause eviction rules, if you want to raise the rent more than 10%, it's on a 90 day notice. If it's less than 10%, it's on a 30 day notice. If you're dealing with multi-unit properties that are over 15 years of age and the tenants have lived there more than 12 months, you're subject to state rent control and you've got to be careful. You need to know that the maximum has got to be under 10% and it's 5% plus the local CPI, which means... Before you raise the rent, you need to know what the local CPI is to know what the maximum is. Generally, it's between 5 and 9%. So it's 5% plus the local CPI, never to be over 10%. And these are for multi-unit properties built over 15 years ago and subject to state or just state uh, just cause eviction laws. Condominiums, single family homes are typically exempt. And if you go back to the original slide, the only reason a single family home or a condominium will not be exempt if it's owned by a corporation or a REIT or where it's an LLC where one of the members is a corporation. Most of our clients are going to be single owners of a condo or single owners in their own name of a single family home. It can get tricky. But the most important thing is when in doubt, reach out to an attorney and I'm available and ask me the question so we can go through the filtration process so you don't make a mistake. And you also need to remember, you need to update your leases. Why? Because if you're signing new leases, you want to make sure your lease is like a California apartment association lease, a California association of realtors lease or a local industry trade group lease, because it will include the statement that the unit is exempt from state or local just cause eviction rules because it's a condominium. If you're using old leases, you don't have that exemption. So all of you, if today you only recognize that anytime you have a vacancy, you're gonna use a 2023 lease, you done good by yourself because that's huge. And I have clients who are signing leases that uh, because their grandfather was so successful in real estate, they're using a one-page lease that the grandfather prepared. And that lease is wholly ineffective for California right now. So at any point, if you have a request for a lease, if I have one handy, I'll send it to you. But leases are also local specific. A San Francisco lease is going to look different than an Oakland lease or a Berkeley lease, because there are different rules and regulations in those counts. Where we don't have a local ordinance, we can use a state lease for that purpose. Let's move on. The next two slides gives you a little bit of guidance on jurisdictions that may have their own rules regarding rent increases. And so when I first started practicing law 30 years ago, there would be Oakland, Berkeley, and San Francisco with rent control and just cause eviction rules. Now there's about 17 different ordinances draping the Bay Area. And so before I can open my mouth, I have to go and learn or at least refresh because it's gotten so complex throughout the Bay Area. For rent increases, as you may or may not know, Oakland has an ordinance, Berkeley has an ordinance, Antioch has an ordinance, Richmond has an ordinance, Hayward has an ordinance, San Leandro has an ordinance. Let's move the slide. Mountain View, Los Gatos, East Palo Alto, all of these have different ordinances. And so even as a real estate professional, which I see some of you are, you've got to know what you know and what you don't know and don't open your mouth because I don't open my mouth because I need to know whether some property, when someone says, oh, I own a property in San Leandro, before I even say anything about San Leandro, I have to know if it's in the unincorporated areas of San Leandro or the incorporated areas of San Leandro. I have to know in Hayward, does the owner own five units or more? 
or less because those are filtration processes which I have to follow. So all I can emphasize is it's tricky. And when it's tricky, it means as an agent, you're not raising rents for people because you're preparing a unit for sale. You want to put them in contact with an attorney and insulate yourself from the risk of making a mistake by doing it improperly. And a lot of clients, as you know, may be a penny smart and a pound foolish. They want to save the cost of a rent increase prepared by an attorney, and they do it by pulling something off the internet, not knowing that the laws that were in place in the 1970s are no longer the laws in place now. And so, so they serve an improper rent increase. And let me give you an example of what's happening right now throughout the Bay Area. There's a young attorney in the East Bay who has a woman who has a voucher for Section 8. And what this woman does is goes on Craigslist, looks for people and phone numbers who are listing property for sale. And she calls the people up by phone and says, do you accept Section 8? And they say no. Then the next day, the attorney sends a letter to these people in San Francisco or in the East Bay saying, hey, you violated the law. You're not allowed to summarily reject a person who has an H, uh, a voucher for a, uh, housing. Therefore, we want three times the rent plus $5,000. And the clients are shocked that they're getting a letter from an attorney because they simply, by ignorance, said, we don't accept Section 8. And that's a tester who then files a lawsuit. And I end up representing many of these clients. And if they, in writing or over the phone, said, we don't accept Section 8, I tell them to settle the case because the cost of fighting the case is more expensive than the ten dollars to $15,000 you have to pay because you made a mistake. And those are the things we want to insulate you from. And if you are a real estate agent and you're helping a client out sell, but in the interim, you're helping them manage their property, you're potentially very risky to your brokerage and to yourself because you don't know what you don't know. And that's what gets you in trouble. And that little example, this guy who's an attorney in the East Bay has decided to shake people down with one person who's calling people up. And there's nothing I can do except for usually just pay because they did, in fact, violate the law. And it's no different than the uh, shakedowns that were occurring on violations of ADA, where uh, a shop owner may have a, um, a um, uh, shelf that's too high or a walkway that's too small for a wheelchair. And all of a sudden they owe the uh, person uh, money because they violated the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is happening all the time. And I can only tell you as an example, if you don't know if your jurisdiction has a rent ordinance, if you don't know the state ordinance, you're better off referring someone to a, uh, an attorney to raise the rent. And that way you insulate yourself from the mistake. Let's move on. All right, so what I've been doing for the last three years for many people are negotiating voluntary move outs. And I negotiate voluntary move outs. So we have a dispute with the tenant. The tenant during COVID wasn't able to pay rent. They're still owing money to an owner. And now with COVID coming to an end, I may be able to proceed with a non-payment or rent eviction. But before I get involved in a non-payment or rent eviction, I ask for a retainer of typically $7,500. The tenant owes maybe $5,000, maybe $20,000. And the eviction process takes 90 to 120 days to get through the court system. So then during the eviction process, you can't collect the rent because if you take any rent money, you waived your right to proceed with the eviction. So you've got a debt of $10,000. You have to pay an attorney a retainer of $7,500. It's going to take 120 days to work itself through the court. And so there's always the option of negotiating a voluntary move out. Let's move the slide next. So my office has, through the pandemic, been negotiating deals with tenants where we negotiate a voluntary move out. So the tenant may owe $10,000 and we say, we'll waive the $10,000 if you move out in two months. And oftentimes it's a win-win situation for the tenant. Their rent is waived. There's a release of claims from an owner and the owner doesn't have to go out of pocket with an attorney to recover possession of the unit. because what a lot of people don't realize is most of the time, even if I go to court and I'm doing an eviction, 
before the eviction action is complete, I may be forced to go to a trial and the cost of the trial may be greater than the amount of the dispute of rent. And so the economics of a eviction means the client is bleeding money. And when you win an eviction action, you do get possession and you may get a piece of paper that says the tenant will owe you $15,000. But the likelihood of you ever collecting the $15,000 is minimal. So what we try to do is fat path of least resistance the fastest and cheapest way to get a tenant out of the premises, taking into account attorney fees, time, and risk. And that's typically the buyout or the rent waiver. And my office is preparing buyout agreements throughout the Bay Area. Each jurisdiction may have a different rule and regulation or protocol to follow, but generally these are the eight questions I need in order to do a deal. It's still a voluntary agreement. The tenant doesn't have to agree. The tenant signs a contract to be out and 95% of the time, the tenant complies with their obligations. Let's move on. And so I've just gone over the eviction process and told you it's about a 120 day period. And if you look at the bottom of the eviction uh, chart, trial one to four days. So a week before the trial, the tenant may now owe you $15,000, but they're entitled to a jury trial. A jury trial can take four days. If you do four days times eight hours a day, that's 32 hours of an attorney time. 32 hours times my hourly fee, which is $500 an hour, is, and I haven't figured this out recently, but it's $16,000. So are you going to spend $16,000 going through a jury trial in order to get a judgment against a tenant for $15,000 when you know the tenant hasn't had a job for three months? is going through a divorce and uh, is unlikely to ever uh, pay you. So those are the issues that we're facing in landlord tenant law, which is you've got to be smart about the economics of the dispute. And I don't want to win the dispute. I want to resolve the dispute, accomplish my client's goals as fast and as cheap as possible, taking into account attorney fees, time and risk. And that's why before I start an eviction process, I'm usually eagerly looking to see if we can get a resolution voluntarily. And that's because that's fast and cheap. And oftentimes I don't want to spend your client's money because I have so much work to do that I don't need the work. I want to do great work. And great work is accomplishing your client's goals as fast and as cheap as possible. And I can only tell you through the eviction moratorium in Alameda County, through the state eviction moratorium, through the San Francisco eviction moratorium, there has been accumulation of a lot of debt. And even with that large debt, there are some tenants who are able to pay that debt off. If you're managing properties in high wealth areas, yes, you don't want to waive it. But if you're managing properties in places that are, uh, you know, more trying, more difficult, waiving the rent, rent to recover possession of the premises is a good business decision. Because if you have to pay an attorney to handle an eviction action, it can become very, very expensive. And in the end, a week before trial, the tenant free attorney is going to say they'll move out in 90 days if you waive all the rent money. And in the end, that may be cheaper than going to trial. So we're going to be in the same place we would have been had we done a buyout agreement, but only three months later. And this is how I see disputes, which is we try to resolve them as fast and as cheap as possible. We only proceed with the eviction process when we're out of options. The tenant is not talking to you. The tenant says, file a lawsuit, I'm not leaving. And you don't have any other choice, but then you've got to hire an attorney. And I've never been more busy. I just had one client uh, who has been waiting for the moratorium to come over. They're sending me 10 cases a day because they're a large property management company and they've got to cycle through the 60 of their thousand units that haven't paid and they have no solution other than to get the eviction action going. Let's move on. So that is in brief a relatively 
rapid review of what I think is core information for you, which is I went over the state rent control rules, the state just cause eviction rules. I talked to you a bit about rent increases and being very, very careful about different jurisdictions. I went through the eviction process a bit and then explained to you why the economics of resolution through a voluntary agreement is ideal. And I wanted to also say to you this, I do a lot of education through mass emails to my clients or to people in the industry. I would welcome your email address because I will be sending you email updates as to new laws that arise and new information that is germane to the real estate community. And it's my privilege to help people out and educate them. That is something that I'm very proud of, which is I want to keep you out of trouble. And it's generally, you don't know the trouble you're creating because it's so complex right now. Landlord-tenant law in California is so much more complex than any other state. And what we have had recently is the emergence of state rent control, state just cause eviction rules, the COVID pandemic, state rules regarding uh, the COVID pandemic, eviction moratoriums in different counties, in different cities, and we're emerging from it. And my guess is there are many owners of property out there who don't understand the rules and will create problems for themselves without even knowing it. They're lovely people. They have wonderful character, but they're like Mr. Magoo driving a vehicle with, with blinders on, not realizing their damage they're causing because they simply don't understand the laws that are in place. And in the Bay Area, you go from Hayward to Fremont, to San Leandro, to uh, Emeryville, to San Jose, you're in different jurisdictions with different rules. And I can only tell you that even a landlord attorney, such as myself, I'm going to refer you out if it's a San Jose matter, because it's far from my office. And there's people in the San Jose courts all the time. And those same attorneys in San Jose will be referring me cases in San Francisco because they're not comfortable with San Francisco's rules and regulations. A three-day notice will look different in San Jose than it will look in Richmond, than it will look in Oakland, than it will look in Berkeley, than it will look in San Francisco or in San Mateo, the city. So you've got to be careful about this. And the whole goal of this brief event today is to just let you know be careful. It's not intuitive. And searching the internet for a template doc is a recipe for disaster. And if you're working at a brokerage or you're an agent and you do well by buying and selling for, be for clients and you don't do management, your best bet is to stay away from it. It's tricky. And what we have a lot of times with um, real estate agents is that there's mission drift. All of a sudden, they're asked to do uh, a sale, and then the client wants you to do some management until the property sells, and that's really unfair for that person. You want to make sure that you're always going to that professional who's doing that work every single day. So as a real estate attorney, I won't do property line disputes. So if someone says, I'm an attorney and I practice real estate, that doesn't tell you anything. Do they do foreclosures? Do they do property line disputes? Do they do... Um, um, real estate transactional disputes. You really need to say, what do you do in order to be a cons uh, an informed consumer? What I do is I handle landlord-tenant disputes throughout the Bay Area, and I know what I know and I know what I don't know, and I'm confident enough that if you ask me a question that I don't know, there's no ego. I don't know, I'll get you the information. And that's what you want from an, uh, a professional is to be confident that their knowledge ends at a certain point and they can always point you in the direction of someone who have that knowledge. I just had a person email me uh, as part of a landlord tenant dispute, a question about tax liability arising out of a transfer of ownership past the death. And I simply say, that's out of my, that, that's out of my core expertise. I can't answer that question. And that's what you want. And um, at this juncture, um, yeah, I'm open for questions and, uh, it's my pleasure to have, uh, given you a brief, uh, summary of what I think are important rules regarding, uh, 
uh, landlord tenant law. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. And I would, uh, I guess the one question I would have is, so you mentioned you wouldn't go to San Jose. So which areas do you cover? Is it by county or how? Uh, it's typically by county. Uh, okay. Contra Costa so County, uh, San Mateo County, San Francisco, Alameda County. Okay. So those four, and um, yeah. that's good to know. Um, I, you know, uh, I've heard from a fellow agent, they're calling we have for realtors, there's a CAR, the California Association of Realtors provides a legal hotline. And mm -hmm. uh, they were calling about a uh, property management issue. And the uh, the attorney there said, don't, you know, the majority of the calls that come in have to do with property management. And if you're not going to specialize in it, don't do it. That, that was the main message. So right. totally echo that. Um, in terms of the eviction moratorium, and uh, I I will ask, uh, I know there's another question, but eviction moratoriums, are we're pretty much out of that, right? Is that uh, The state eviction correct? moratorium is over. Okay. Uh, and that's wonderful. How about because, Alameda uh, County? I know that was linked. Alameda County, it. um, it's um, coming to an end, the end of this month. Uh, but the three jurisdictions have elongated the moratorium, Oakland, Berkeley, and San Leandro. So it's always uh, city specific. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's been tricky is that we had a state moratorium, we had county moratoriums, and then we had city moratoriums. And as you would suspect, the more progressive the city in terms of its policy, policies, the more protections that have been afforded uh, tenants. And so it becomes particularly uh, tricky on this. Thank you. And um, there was a question because you had mentioned Section Eight case, the Section Eight case back uh, during your uh, in the middle of the discussion. Uh, you mentioned San, I think uh, Alameda and East Bay and San Francisco, but the Section Eight law. Can you go over that a little bit? That I believe that's statewide. Well, you're not allowed to discriminate against a person based upon the source of their income. And income is broadly defined. So if someone has a voucher, that's something that you can't uh, discriminate against. So if you summarily reject a Section 8 tenant, you could have liability. And it's particularly problematic in the jurisdictions I broached, Alameda County and San Francisco. The most important thing is if you're actively uh, putting a unit up for rent and someone asks you a question such as, do you allow for emotional support animals? Do you take applications from Section 8? Your response is always, we welcome all applications. Here's an application, please submit it. You don't wanna say no, because when you say no, you create risk. And when you say we welcome all applicants, please submit an application, you're not discriminating against people. And that's how I recommend you handle things. And that's well, statewide, regardless yeah, of which kind of... Right, and for pets. So uh, someone says, look, I have a service animal because I have a handicap. Do you uh, accept uh, dogs at the premises? And you then respond, we have a no pets policy. You created liability for yourself immediately because you said no pets. An emotional support animal, a service animal is not a pet. And you create liability by doing that. So less is more in your communications with people who are prospective applicants. We invite all applicants Here's an application. Please send it in. That's how I do it. Hmm. So if somebody has a dog or a cat and they're wondering, would you take a pet? You would just say we accept all applicants. You wouldn't actually. Uh, I would be very careful on the word dog, cat, because if they call it an emotional support animal or they call it a service animal, certainly you can't call it a pet. Right. right? Okay. You're entitled and to have a no pets policy, but it gets tricky when someone comes to you and says, look, I have an emotional support animal. The ignorant owner will say we have a no pets policy. The informed owner will be we welcome all applicants mm -hmm. uh, and inclusive of people who have emotional support animals. Perfect. That's good. I'm going to I'm glad that we're recording this so I can yeah. get that uh, statement. And then um, going back to Section 8. So although you welcome all applicants, there's no requirement that says you have to take someone with the Section 8 voucher or anything. Right. And well, there's no requirement. as to There's no no requirement. They may not meet the uh, threshold credit uh, requirements. They may uh, not have good personal professional references. There may be stronger applicants. You're allowed to select the strongest applicant. Mm -hmm. It's just you don't want to be involved in discrimination right out the gate. 
Got it. Um, and then now going to the buyouts, and if anybody has questions, you're welcome to put them in to the chat. Now, in terms of the buyout, uh, what are you generally looking at in terms of costs? What are what is it that somebody uh, say in San Francisco? Because that's very common. Well, um, the average buyout, at? the average buyout in San Francisco is forty thousand dollars. So, but that's because if you sell a unit vacant versus tenant occupied, there may be a swing of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the sale price. San Francisco is a different animal because if you're doing an owner move and eviction, you, you may have to pay $7,500 per tenant up to $22,000. So if you're a seller and you want to sell a unit vacant, the tenant may say, I'll, uh, I'll leave for $40,000 because my three tenants are going to get $22,000 on an owner move and eviction. In other places, it's all negotiable and it's all, you know, sometimes I get a waiver of rent from move out. Sometimes I uh, have a waiver of rent plus the return of the security deposit. Sometimes it's an additional 5,000. It's all over the place. The owner needs to know their math as to when it makes sense and when it doesn't. And I'm happy to consult with an owner as to how to do a buyout, how to set it up. It's a little bit, it's a little bit of law and a lot of social engineering. And so there's a process that we could follow that helps. So during COVID, I was writing letters to tenants about COVID rent debt saying, you're accumulating rent debt. Uh, we're not waiving the debt. You'll still owe it despite the pandemic. We're entitled to the money at some time. And then the owner maybe a week later would reach out after receiving a letter from me the owner would reach out to the tenant and say, look, you know, my preference is that we resolve this amicably. Would you consider voluntarily vacating? And I would consider waiving the rent. And that sort of pressure from an attorney and then a dialogue by the owner was successful in getting some of these units um, vacated. Because if they're not vacated and the tenant continues to not pay the rent, you're going to spend a small fortune using an attorney to uh, proceed with the eviction process. Sure. Um, great. And it, so another question that came in is, am I correct that Section 8, so are Section 8 tenants exempt from state rent control? Uh, they, they are e e exempt from state rent control. And um, in a buyout, can you still report a negative comment on their credit? You, you certainly could. Um, there's no prohibition against it, but it would probably uh, be contrary to the spirit of the agreement. You know, we have in some of our buyout agreements, we have a confidentiality provision and a non-disparagement provision because oftentimes I don't want a tenant to move out, take money, and then uh, uh, on Yelp uh, write mm -hmm. negatives about the owner mm -hmm. because you know if we're giving you the benefit of waiving rent, we expect you to behave honorably as you exit. So it cuts both ways. I see. So and then also you can probably put in there, uh, you know that if you agree to this, then you wouldn't, it won't affect your credit or something like that to make it more attractive uh, to I, tenant? Is that I, I just, uh, it just would generally be, um, you could report them if uh, the agreement is silent on that. But, um, you know, if you're waiving the rent, the question is, did they really have a rent debt after they left or not? You could mm -hmm. write that they didn't timely pay their rent. But in my mind, um, uh, it probably suggests that you're better off not reporting them. Thank you. Um, and uh, going back to emotional support animals. So sure. what are the rules around that? Just kind of in a nutshell to keep in mind, is there a certification? Oh, there's a, it, it's tremendously complex. It's prone to abuse. They're used to, uh, the most uh, upsetting thing is where an owner has a no pets policy in a building. The tenant submits an application, the application is granted, the tenant moves in, and then two days later, uh, requesting a reasonable accommodation because they have a service or an emotional support animal and they never told the owner about it. And the owner has to get, allow them to have that animal because it's an emotional support animal. And if the person has proper documentation with a proper um, uh, recommendation by a, a care provider, you're pretty much out of luck. There's a lot of abuse because tenants can go uh, online and get a, a third party to generate a letter. But uh, I would say, let's handle it on a case by case basis. So if someone's confronted with a request for an emotional support animal, they should contact my office. 
Sounds good. And can you speak a little bit to um, what are some of the new laws you mentioned that they're, and, and I'm aware of some that, that they're trying to pass statewide for um, regarding Costa Hawkins and et cetera. So could you speak a little bit to that in terms of what to watch out for or well, what we should be aware of? Sure. So um, there is a movement throughout the state to one, tighten up the state laws on just cause eviction and rent regulation. And there's also an attempt to try to uh, get rid of Costa Hawkins, which Costa Hawkins is the law that does not regulate rents for single family homes, condominium units, and when units become vacant. And uh, there's an attempt to regulate Costa, to get rid of the Costa Hawkins law. The reason why it's called Costa Hawkins is because those were the two last names of the legislators who put in the law. So Costa Hawkins is just the name of the two gentle people who uh, submitted the law. But there is a movement now that is proceeding to try to remove the freedom from rent regulation for single family homes and condominium units. Yeah, that's pretty big. Um, okay, Shoot. are there, yeah, it is out there. Um, and I think uh, definitely it seems like there's, you know, laws are ever changing. Uh, we will be uh, sending out Daniel, you can see his information here, but we'll also be uh, sending out his information in a follow up email just so that everybody can have it. Um, definitely a great resource, and I would I would highly recommend getting on the email list because uh, I when I get Daniel's emails, I save it for a time when I can actually go through and read it really well because there's so much that's going on, and and he's definitely uh, very well versed in that. Um, are there any other questions or anything that people um, have would like to know about? How about uh, just a question in terms of if a tenant is going to be breaking their lease early, needs to leave mm -hmm. early, what are some of the considerations on that? Well, I get that question quite a bit. If a tenant uh, has a 12 month lease and they're leaving on the 10th month because they've been um, sent to New York for work or they have a family member who's ill, mm -hmm. uh, if they leave, they're in breach of contract. Um, they are obligated to uh, pay for uh, the rent that has accrued uh, for that two month period but an owner has an obligation always to mitigate damages by trying to re-rent the place. If they're unable to re-rent the place for two months, they uh, the tenant owes that money. If they are able to re-rent it, uh, let's say on month 12, then the tenant owes one month of additional rent plus the additional cost, the ancillary cost of having to re-rent it. Most importantly, when a tenant breaches, you contact an attorney, I can write a letter, real quickly to the tenant. Dear tenant, you had a fixed term lease. You breached the agreement by vacating early. We will attempt to mitigate your damages. Here's a security deposit accounting. However, we are holding your security deposit for the accruing debt that is arising as a result of your breach, right? You still have to deal with the security deposit. I have a lot of people don't understand that they still have to do that security deposit accounting. They simply hold the money pending the breach, and then after the dust clears and you figure out how much rent or debt the tenant owes, you make a decision whether you're going to go to small claims court, whether it's a huge amount of money and you want to go to regular court, or you whether or whether you want to not pursue it because you don't want the aggravation of chasing people for debt. Okay, thank you. And um, there is a uh, oh, I I know before this other question, uh, there's. I believe in there's some talk about the security deposit, about limiting that, limiting it further. Right now it's at two and a half months. But it, actually it's two months for oh, a months. unfurnished mm -hmm. unit, three months for oh, a furnished. furnished unit. And uh, there's a desire to try to limit it to no more than one month. And is so, that gonna happen you think or? <laughs> I, I have no idea. And, and okay. like I said earlier, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Sure. I execute on laws that have been passed. I can comment on laws that haven't been passed, but I'm not actively uh, watching everything that's going on in Sacramento. I will tell you this though, it's starting to look like housing, even if you own it privately, is behaving like a utility where you have to get permission to raise rents, where they're limiting when you can terminate. And that noose is getting tighter and tighter on the ability to use your personal property in a way that you'd like without any sort of limitations. 
and housing because it's so political because we have such a crisis is one area where those regulations just keep coming into place and as we have a bigger divide uh, between people who are wealthy and people who are struggling uh the the tension is on that housing issue and that's why we're seeing a, a tremendous amount of litigation and uh new rules regarding it definitely and I, i've also seen a lot of movement about uh, registries you know where you have to register your investment property and some control over that so um, a lot moving so i would yes. encourage everyone if you have investment property or thinking about getting it um Definitely have Daniel as a resource, but also um, pay attention to what's happening in your jurisdiction, in your city, in your county, because that's going to matter. Um, there's a question that came in, and I'm not sure if this is tenant. tenant uh, can, yeah. I, I saw the question. Uh, mm -hmm. So if a tenant moves out and they're let, they're owing you money that arose during their tenancy and it arose during a period of the pandemic, you can certainly re, uh, subtract the security deposit for that unpaid rent. There's nothing in the pandemic that forces you to waive rent. There was a delay in demanding it, but once a tenancy is over, you're certainly entitled to pursue it. Okay, great. And then there's another question about um, this one, I think is not so much of a, a tenant one, but about yeah. a tree yeah. and a fence. I don't typically handle border disputes, uh, but I can tell you uh, that if you have a tree with limbs hanging over another neighbor's property, the neighbor who has the limbs hanging over is entitled to cut those uh, branches that are trespassing over their property line, but they have to do so in a manner does, that does not hurt the tree. Yeah, uh, look, it's my pleasure. And um, you know, if people would like to be on my email uh, list, uh, Gene, if you would uh, collect the emails and, and send them to me in bulk, I'll get them on the list. And otherwise, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. And again, it's my pleasure to help. Well, thank you. And thank you so much, Daniel, because I know you're very busy, but I love that you love to educate people and help get the information out there. That's what we're all about as well. So yeah, um, of course. So Thanks. Thanks for organizing this and everybody have a, a wonderful uh, Wednesday and go Warriors, I guess.